Well, welcome to this um, special colloquia. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Padu Sushire, who's currently a uh, professor of mathematical sciences as well as the associate dean for academic affairs uh, um, at George Mason University. He also directs the STEM Accelerator Program and the Center for Mathematics Professional Outreach and Educational Technology, uh, also known as COMPLETE, um, at uh, George Mason. Uh, he's also served as a program director at the National Science Foundation and um, is looking forward to returning in sometime in the future. His research interests are in um, computational mathematics and scientific computing, uh, as well as computational biomechanics, uh, and especially STEM education. Uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him last night, and we had a, a lot of interesting discussions about um, opportunities and uh, approaches uh, in furthering STEM education, um, which is uh, something that on this campus, we're also very interested in and looking for uh, new and uh, different and yet more effective ways of um, reaching more broadly into the community and uh, helping people have as much fun with math as we do. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Bill and uh, Andreas, for, uh, for inviting me here and uh, Farzina for arranging everything. This is really great. I think the highlight has been uh, to work with uh, students, uh, you know, talking um, all these sessions before this, uh, working with different groups, SIAM chapter, to the fellows, uh, the CSC fellows, to um, uh, uh, I'm even lo losing track of the number of uh, <laughs> groups that I met today, but this is great though because uh, what's that? Spin. The spin, yes, <laughs> that's a really good name, the spin. So um, I think uh, that one I'm very uh, especially excited about is the innovation. So um, that is something I've started doing a lot in the last few years. Uh, um, at the at the NSF, I was directing the computational mathematics program and also working on workforce development, so which is STEM education, and, uh, and also working with other directorates, uh, uh, like the education and human resources and all that. So I started getting involved in a lot of other uh, uh, projects and um, you know, going beyond uh, my traditional scientific computing and computational mathematics training. Uh, I started asking, uh, or actually students would come and ask me questions, and so lately I don't pick any projects myself, the students pick the projects, so for example, a student would come and tell me, uh, this summer, uh, a student from Puerto Rico came and told me uh, he had two cousins uh, who were both recruited by gangs. Can we do some mathematical modeling and computation of gangs? This is how the conversation starts. and then. Uh, I have no idea about that topic, and he is, uh, you know, physically interested in that topic, and uh, you know, uh, somehow he wants to solve it. That's a good starting point, and I know some math and computing, so this is a good place to start. And we start talking back and forth, and then we start uh, figuring out how does this actually happen. Well, it probably propagates somehow, and people are getting infected. And the moment the word infected started to come, you know. Uh, I realized, oh, how about infectious diseases? Maybe getting into gangs is like infectious diseases. And then you start talking about, well, gangs, what, what age do they get into gangs? And so we start categorizing them into different type of uh, groups uh, of people, and then start to actually come up with a model. Well, we've come up with some kind of diagrams and then come up with some kind of differential equations, and then you, before you know there's a big bunch of differential equations that you have to solve, and now it's a big data problem. Uh, and so we presented that problem at the, uh, to the congresswoman at uh, uh, the US Capitol earlier this summer, and uh, they were so excited that uh, you can actually use mathematics and computing for uh, a, a, a problem, a societal problem, and they said, we're gonna open up every single police station to you, and we're gonna give you the data on who is getting recruited through gangs, We'll give you the age group and all that stuff. Now you're really talking data coming in uh, real time. And then you want to actually figure out uh, 
uh, you know, some, some information from that. So if the model can provide. So that's an example of a, of, a, of a societal problem that can turn into math and computing, for example. On the left is another problem that I, uh, I picked up because, again, once again, it comes from a student and said, uh, every 15 minutes, an elephant is being killed. Uh, for its uh, tusks, and uh, rhino is also also being killed, and so this is in Tanzania. So, uh, what can we do? You know, so when students come and ask questions like this to a mathematician or a computational mathematician, you have to have the you know uh, we have to we don't have the training to immediately turn that question into oh I know exactly how to do that problem, but but it's it's good that we start talking back and forth, and I'm going to tell you how we ended up uh, uh, doing something. I actually uh, had an opportunity to take three students from Princeton University. Princeton had a program called the International Internship Program. If UAUC has such a program, I'll be happy to take students to Africa. But So three students from uh, Princeton, one from Puerto Rico, one from uh, George Mason, and, uh, and a high school student. All of them joined on the trip to, with me to uh, you know, kind of run behind elephants, basically, and trying to figure out uh, how can we solve this problem. And uh, I'm going to tell you the story later on how we ended up solving it. Well, we didn't really solve solve it, but at least try to get a good insight of how to solve that problem. And uh, and uh, I also have a big uh, passion for working with teachers, essentially working with them to take something back to the classroom. So, you know, uh, essentially enhancing their pedagogical practices. And, uh, you know, here is a bunch of math teachers that are working with an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope, uh, many of you may know, is uh, basically has, you know, uh, uh, two wires coming out, and then on the other side is like an accelerometer, something that you find in your cell phones. And of course, it'll tell you your X, Y, Z coordinates and all that stuff. But if you take the accelerometer and put it in your throat and start humming, what do you think will happen? You'll start to see waves on the oscilloscope. So this is when you see you know, how cool math teachers are singing. Okay? So they explode into singing, and you know, it's amazing graphs come in and all that. And then I say, well, let's take a break and ask the teachers to go out. And then when they come back in, I have a graph already on the screen. I now say, hum like the graph. So then they realize, what do you mean hum like the graph? I said, yeah, match, the, match, the, match everything on the graph, the frequency, the amplitude, everything. And now they realize how challenging the problem is. They have to train themselves. It's almost like machine learning. Train themselves to actually match the graph. And so when they try to do that, then I tell them the story. I say, well, we have a, a student uh, who's a paraplegic, I mean, his hand, limbs, uh, hands, nothing works, so he, he comes on this wheelchair, and uh, his only goal in life is to, uh, is to be able to actually do everything himself, and uh, um, so they tried everything possible, uh, he didn't respond to any, the, I mean, he would come back to, come and come to the bioengineering lab, I have a faculty position in the bioengineering also, so they come to the uh, bioengineering lab, and then uh, one day he saw he was sitting behind a graduate student, and the graduate student finished his work and started playing car racing. He was playing something with cars, and so obviously the cars were taking turns, and so the, uh, the, for the first time, the kid in the back started to hum, and he hummed like the cars were turning, like mm, mm, and all that stuff. Immediately, the grad student gets the idea. He said, oh, all I have to do is like take something like y equals a sine bx plus c plus d, you know, and program that into the wheelchair, and so he can actually control the wheelchair himself. He can control the amplitude. He can control the frequency and things like that. Something, you know, talk about STEM, and so then I said the story to the teachers and said, next time you teach pre-calculus and write down the equation, today we are going to learn y equals a sine bx plus c plus d, please start with the, start with the problem, not with the mathematics. So often we, you know, we tend to actually present the mathematics and then the problem. It's very important to reverse the philosophy and start with the problem and then present the mathematics. So, so this is uh, something I'm very passionate about. And uh, uh, several things I'll talk about today will involve these, this type of flavor. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I just want to remind people, you probably already know that uh, NSF in the last uh, couple of years, actually after the new director came, uh, she, uh, she kind of organized her thoughts and she came up with 10 big ideas. So the 10 big ideas were actually classified into research ideas and process ideas. So research ideas, you know, the, some of the areas that 
Um, NSF, after, done, after doing lots of stakeholder and focus groups and all that, they thought, you know, data uh, clearly is one of the big areas. You know, uh, technology, uh, you know, Arctic. Uh, so they identified these different uh, areas. And of course, mathematics, for example, they said, oh, you could probably find a place here, find place in data, find place in quantum leap. And computing, of course, will, uh, will play a role in lots of things. Process ideas, definitely, you know, uh, for example, institutes and infrastructures. And uh, this is a very special program. You know, it's about including nations, diverse, uh, underrepresented learners in engineering and science. It's a big program, actually. They're investing a lot of money into this program. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. If you go and see the 37 projects that have been funded, it's everything from a group that is just working on students with disabilities. You know, so it has to be completely different. And uh, how do you take, so for example, I think computing is clearly going to be uh, the next 10 years in terms of uh, uh, all their mission, you know, women in computing. So there's a lot of uh, different types of uh, uh, goals uh, there are. So of course, these are, um, I mean, all of them, I would say, is, are, uh, are purposeful in the sense like if you're, if you're going to be writing NSF proposals, you know, it will be wiser to actually somehow figure out how your, uh, you know, your objectives fall into one of these categories. Uh, so you don't have to drive these categories to drive your proposal. But if it's the other way and say, oh, this can actually apply to this topic, you know, it's, uh, it's a win-win for both, of, both uh, the sub person submitting. And also, uh, you know, if you do get selected, then uh, they will look for where, which of these things will be able to fund that project. So it's a very... Uh, the next 2025, they're going to be looking for these things as one of the main things. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, within the uh, mathematics, for example, there's several programs, uh, 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 mathematics and mathematics across. So these are all, many, many folks don't even know that there are separate programs just for big data uh, that is sitting there. And uh, so it's a very important thing for uh, you know, for you to find out where all you can, uh, uh, you can actually partner with other people to work on different programs. So I thought I had a, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so these guys are all the training programs. We talked about it. Somebody asked me about, uh, they call it mouse proof. It's the, it's the postdoctoral research fellowship. It's, you know, it's fairly, it's a grant, uh, that you can get, uh, around 150k for somebody who wants to do postdoctoral research work. Uh, this is the, uh, this is what uh, uh, enhanced doctoral training, it's what morphed as, uh, you know, you're getting trained in mathematical sciences or computing. Can you actually add the component on internships, you know, as you're being uh, trained, uh, can you actually have, and it used to be called MCTP, and I understand UIUC, uh, you guys have one of the earlier versions of this. Uh, of course, REU sites. I know that uh, NCSA already has a REU site. This is, of course, very, very uh, good to have because. Uh, and then this is one that uh, I'm not sure if UIUC has it, but uh, RTGs. This is a really, this is one of those big ones. Uh, you know, uh, 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 so research training groups. It's it's uh, you could build like a. It could be research training groups of postdocs. It could be research training groups of young, uh, I mean, junior faculty members. It could be research training groups of, uh, you know, uh, doctoral students to uh, undergraduate students. Or you could put a nice mentorship type pipeline program, but uh, focused on a, on a big theme. So this is a really, it's a big, uh, fairly uh, big program. And uh, the Graduate Research Fellowship Program, I've advised several students to apply. And uh, those that are graduating, undergraduates that are graduating, uh, uh, and students that do not have a master's, you, you are definitely eligible to apply. And then those that have gone to work and they have come back and then decided to, you know, give graduate studies a shot, they are definitely somebody you should think about. And then those that are interested in graduating and going into STEM education, actually, and going maybe as a high school teacher and things like that. There's another separate part for that. So uh, those are all different types of uh, uh, opportunities that you should apply for. NRT used to be the former IGERT and, uh, you know, the, uh, what used to be called as the Integrated Graduate Education Research and Training. 
Now it's like, uh, again, research and training and uh, across, this is across divisions and all that. So to get uh, successful at that, multiple colleges uh, need to come together and, uh, and work on these things. And then they have, uh, you know, uh, I was advising some faculty also, you know, if you are grant, if you're working on Maxwell's equation, for example, and it has, you know, uh, it may not have direct connection to optics. We know that you can do optics with that, but but if you can relate it to uh, optics, so there are existing, uh, uh, you know, programmatic features where they will, they will expect you to actually look at, uh, you know, I mean, it'll be helpful to actually say, oh, my research will address these topics and all that. So I'll be happy to share this slide, you know, uh, working at the NSF was like, uh, you know, uh, first uh, six months was just understanding what these four letter words meant. So, you know, it's because people only, they didn't talk full sentences there. They would talk in code language and you had to know what they were talking about. So I'm going to give you the homework. Uh, but these two, these three programs are really good for those. Some of the graduate students were asking me about what this program is. This is the same REU program, but for our, uh, graduate students to spend uh, somewhere international. So for example, you can take, uh, you'll be, it's like an REU program. The program is already, say, in Colombia. And you go and actually work on a research project there for eight weeks. That's the idea. So, so the, the solicitation must have just come out. And uh, this is really a good program to go after. Now, these two programs are kind of complementary programs. PEER stands for Partnership for Enhanced Engagement in Research. You can only get a PEER if you have an existing NSF grant or an existing NIH grant or an existing USGS or EPA. Now they've expanded to several other agencies. Uh, all these agencies can work with USAID. So USAID is the main partner that connects to these developing countries. And the grant is given to the developing country. So the PIs in the developing country are the ones that can use this grant, the PEER, Partnership for Enhanced. But in order for them to get the grant, they need a US collaborator having one of these active grants. So anybody with an NSF grant, this is, a, this is the best way to start a partnership with a developing country. If you don't have connections, please let me know. I work with lots of countries. And uh, this, once you have one of those, that will lead to a PIRE very well. Because PIRE is for the US side. So it's partnership for uh, uh, international, I mean, research and education where you can support faculty, students, uh, you know, uh, activities to go this way to go to the developing country. And so uh, this is, you know, if it's the order of $5 million. So it's a pretty big grant, actually. So and, uh, uh, and so this, of course, you can only win if you have multiple stakeholders, multiple institutions coming together with some foreign partners and all that. So, so this is uh, something. So I will, I'll start off with, uh, uh, so for example, uh, for Tanzania, uh, I got the first peer when I was a faculty member. And uh, so this is with the vice chancellor of the institution. He was the PI. And uh, it was on computational mathematics, modeling, analysis, biological, bioinspired. So it sounds like the title for the talk today. And uh, it was interesting that uh, I only got it for one year because it was at the end of my grant. And I learned about it just then. And I said, oh, I'm going to ask for a near extension on my grant and I'll match it with my grant and ask for this thing. And it, it ended up winning for Tanzania, the first award for Tanzania. And, uh, but what was interesting, and you can uh, learn about what the abstract and all that is, what was interesting is it started off with a workshop. There's the dean of uh, the school, this Nelson Mandela statue. This is the uh, institution. Uh, uh, Nelson Mandela wanted four institutes of excellence in Africa. One was established in uh, Nigeria, focused on oil. One was in uh, uh, Burkina Faso, one was in South Africa, and one was in uh, Tanzania, Arusha. And uh, this was focused on life sciences, conservation. All of them had computing as in their flavor. So what this project was about, how to build STEM capacity in Africa on working on real world projects. This is the first time, you know, I was always working on real world projects, but what was real world became really apparent to me when I worked on their projects. So it was like students would come to me and say, uh, by the way, all these things are master's thesis uh, uh, or, or PhDs. Uh, this, one, this one is becoming a PhD. Uh, so this one is the student that came and said, I want to build schools. This is how they'll start conversation. As a math faculty, you're thinking, okay, I need to 
work on architecture or I need to teach him some sophisticated trigonometry or something like that. But then quickly the conversation will change into, no, 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 this, this one teacher and there's 120 kids sitting, in the, uh, sitting on the floor. So how do, we, how do we optimize this? And then slowly after you keep talking, you realize that they don't have a proper census. Uh, they don't keep track of the registration system. So what this project ended up being was the student created a mathematical model uh, for nonlinear population dynamics. And that particular model predicts, so he took Tanzania, he divided that into zones. In each zone he found districts, in each district he found hospitals, in each hospital he found nurses. And Tanzania may not have a lot of things, but they all have multiple cell phones. So we take, took advantage of the cell phones, and the cell phones would SMS. Today two babies were born, one was a boy, one was a girl. Uh, three people died, two guys and one lady, and this was the age. They died of you know, Ebola or whatever it is, and they would text it. The nurses from the hospitals, in the districts, in the zones, they would text it. And these texts would come into a common database, which runs this guy's MATLAB software. Okay? <laughs> Great MATLAB software, which advises the census to say, go build more schools. It's time, you've reached capacity, build the next school. That was his master's thesis. Okay, so just to give you an idea. So uh, this was, of course, on poaching. This is, of course, uh, uh, people actually doing tobacco curing. So the fumes are coming. So for me, I'm trying to turn, sitting there and trying to see where's the math, where's the math. And so quickly, that is an advection diffusion equation. And, uh, and then I try to connect it to disease models and things like that because people were coming into hospitals with infection in the lungs and things like that. So we tried to connect two things. Uh, and it became a big bunch of differential equations that they had to solve and all that stuff. So, so it was about building capacity. So this project uh, uh, led to 20 masters and PhDs in three and a half years in Africa, which they've never heard of in Tanzania. So just to look, so this is the type of impact that you can have in another country. So, and so that's the uh, peer side. And uh, so here is nitrogen uh, fixation uh, with a bacteria, rhizobia. So this is one of those... Uh, bacteria that fixes nitrogen for the plants, for legumes, and then the legumes are, uh, uh, you know, so uh, are also benefiting from the, uh, from the bacteria. The bacteria is also eating the, uh, eating the legumes. So it's like a nice way, it's called a mutualistic model. So you can take all the predator-prey models and turn it into, turn the negative signs into positive signs and you get mutualistic models. And uh, so you can actually talk about how uh, two species can help each other. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, demand in agriculture for these types of models and all that. So what was for tied with each one of them is also an innovation. So for example, how can this turn into an innovation? Well, at the Nelson Mandela, they were also creating a research park like the ones that you guys have here. So what if you put this bacteria into the seeds, into the legumes? And so it's called seeding. So now they're investing in this. So, you know, you can actually have this, this phenomenon that can actually go on. So, so anyway, these are the first graduates from the institution and all that. So, uh, so I should not have shown this, but anyway, so going back to this poaching, uh, uh, the story was, uh, you know, I had these students from Princeton University and uh, student from Puerto Rico, student from uh, these high school students. So right on the first day after I take them, they already formed their own little groups. The three Princeton girls formed their group and the Puerto Rico kid, the George Mason kid and the, and the high school kid formed their group. And uh, we land there. Uh, uh, one evening and uh, jet lagged and all that and I said come and tell me some interesting ways. I have never seen this, this I just interviewed them on Skype and then I, I, I meet them in Africa. So, and, uh, so they, they come there in the morning and my plan is to have them tell me some potential solutions to solve this problem. So around, uh, uh, you know, I get this, uh, you know, the students uh, uh, from Princeton are trying to come up with these really fancy ideas with robots walking in the Serengeti. And uh, so I had to really say, wait, this is the Serengeti. This is like, the, you know, <laughs> uh, come up with a feasible solution. You know, so, and, uh, so here's the Puerto Rican kid. And you know, he, he just came and, you know, had his good breakfast. And, you know, they had already chatted with the high school kid and said, well, maybe something that 
sees the poacher from the sky. I said, what sees the poacher from the sky? And uh, so this is something I've really become very good at is talking to people and asking them more and more and then slowly something gets formed and then he says, something that has eyes and is watching the poacher from the, from the top. I said, where do they see the poacher? Well, where the elephants are congregating. Where does the elephants congregate? Well, maybe at water holes or, or when they're mating and things like that. So maybe that's where the poachers are going to be. So this guy was actually going towards the solution. And I used a framework called design thinking, and some of you probably know about design thinking, where you do the empathy first, the needs assessment, then you define the problems, then you ideate solutions, and then you prototype and test it. So what we were doing was ideating solutions here. And uh, so he said, maybe something that is talking to somebody, and you know, the, he was still thinking birds. You know, so maybe he has not, never seen a drone in his life because I could see the other students like raising their hand and saying, we know exactly what he's up to. I said, yeah, so what is it? Uh, so essentially we ended up building drones, okay? And uh, this turned out to be, this project also had a student from Africa who was finishing his PhD on this. He's actually developing a full-blown uh, navigation and monitoring system, which actually uh, will help uh, to tag these elephants and trying to, they have RFIDs and things like that. So it's a big project, but, but I, what I wanted students to learn, and this is after giving some talks at the State Department, I realized, and Bill Cole Glacier, who was the former uh, uh, director of the center who reported to John Kerry, so he, he, you know, he also felt the same thing, that the students in the US are extremely strong in theory and extremely strong when it comes to applying and computing, but the global knowledge is pretty weak. So when we say, I'm solving a real world problem, what are you solving? You know, I'm solving a big code, I'm writing a huge code. For what? For running it faster, cheaper, and more accurate. That's great. That's the, we should go beyond that. What about impact on society? What societal problem are you trying to solve? So this is where the next uh, set of things, and NSF is also, Kind of, you know, even though it, the research is scientifically founded, found, you know, founded always, there needs to be an impact also. So this is also a broader impact. So essentially, um, so this, this evolved. And of course, uh, you probably have heard of mosquito drones. This is the latest uh, thing that uh, has not hit the market yet, but it can actually, it's probably flying. So it, it, uh, it has a camera, microphone, and everything. So uh, when I have spare time, I usually build drones. So, you know, so this is something... Uh, that has been exciting for me, and uh, but I'm a mathematician at heart also, and a computational mathematician. So, I, yeah, so students come, uh, I, I want to give them projects that, it's not just engineering, I want to turn it into also mathematics, because I think STEM. So engineering was great, because we were able to, so, you know, uh, think about drones and all that, and we, this is uh, the vice chancellor, and this is the student who's, who's building these drones and all that, but it offers a whole lot of other things. You could do swarming, you could do mapping algorithms, machine learning, and then lots and lots of applications. It's a huge project, okay? And, and the one thing that excites me is STEM education. So we had like 1,000 students come. Uh, you're not able to see it here clearly, but 1,000 students come in two days and learn about how STEM can be uh, involved. And I had actually had these US students help me uh, demonstrate lots and lots of uh, experiments like many of you are saying you go to the high school this is what we did there we picked a high school in Africa and actually did the whole thing and so I'm, I'm always taking students with me so if you're interested in any of these international opportunities let me know okay um, so one student's project ended up being the following drones and mechanics this uh, went to the White House last year so essentially uh, this student wanted to do physics and uh, you know so the drone has to move if it has to move you need to know mechanics so obviously you want to start talking about you know uh, uh, how does the how do you describe the motion in each direction you want to talk about uh, you know different types of rotation uh, and then you come up with a system of equations of course when you do that you can always do some simulations and try to actually map map it to the drone remember they are also flying a drone Drone, building a drone, so which means now you are getting real data. Once you have real data, you want to actually do some control mechanism. So can you add on some optimal control to it and then actually build, you know, tell how good your model is. So this is the type of thing that the students are getting excited about because now they have real data, they have this thing, and they have the actual mathematical model, and they're going back and finding out the parameters in the model and things like that. So uh, a second student worked on, you know, the drone is of course monitoring something. If it's monitoring something, is it monitoring a poacher? Is it, is it looking at a ranger or is it looking at an animal? And uh, that's, uh, it has to learn. So it has to learn, meaning 
this is where a good place for machine learning to come in. And uh, these are uh, areas that are uh, still could be investigated. So one can come up with some kind of a target detection algorithm for misdetection and false alarm. And you know, we came up with some, you know, uh, the student was excited because we were able to use middle school uh, conditional probability yeah, to come up with their own theorems and all that. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're able to actually come up with, uh, uh, if somebody tells me that there is a poacher in that area, what's the probability that, you know, if I go to this certain place, I will find the poacher, right? So we were able to use those types of things. And then this is something that I can take to a middle school now and say, look, you can actually use conditional probability, right? So this article is published in Siam News, uh, where I used design thinking for understanding poaching and mathematical research. This was in the last article, last uh, series, I think. Uh, I want to shift gears. I, uh, I'm not sure how, how long I'm talking, but I have a whole lot of stuff to say, but uh, I'll just see. So, uh, because it said biological, bio-inspired, I'm, I'm walking through a first application. This is a circle of Willis, and this is, uh, this sac-like structure is called an aneurysm, and uh, essentially, these are focal dilatations of the arterial wall. They, there's no good news. Once they, they grow, they rupture. Once they rupture, they basically form a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and so the patient gets... Uh, uh, a stroke, uh, you know, 50% of them die, 50% of them get neurological disorder. Women tend to have more, uh, you know, uh, of these cases and they are still investigating why. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, studies on this, so that's going on. Like, you know, for example, you could have aneurysms with narrow neck, aneurysms with the broad neck, aneurysms that are fused. In fact, we have PhDs on each one of these and uh, heavy, heavy computational problems these are because you got the fluid that's coming in. This is like the uh, standard uh, gold standard. You go and uh, cut the patient and put a metal clip so that the blood flow is restored and so the blood is not pushing the wall and rupturing it so it restores, it, it does its uh, normal job or you go and occlude it and this is called endovascular occlusion. So here once again you got Navia Stokes interacting with the wall and most people that are doing CFD they ignore the, the wall as a rigid uh, situation or you know the, or the other way the solid mechanics and the, and the fluid dynamics uh, groups uh, focusing on different things and all that. So this is great uh, because we wanted to know uh, the properties of the wall that can impact uh, uh, the interaction with the fluid. So this is a whole fluid structural attraction study that started. And a lot of uh, interesting questions like, you know, uh, is the aneurysm like a balloon, for example? If I keep blowing a party balloon, there will be a certain point at which the, uh, the volume will increase even though you don't have to blow so much air. So is that what is happening inside? Then they quickly realized uh, aneurysm is not a, not a rubber material. So, and then, of course, like dynamic instability. So, you know, when the blood is pushing it, you get some kind of resonance behavior and actually can it explode because of that. And then this is the standard criteria. If you go to the doctor, they'll say, oh, you're, you're ready for surgery. The question is, when are you ready for surgery? And, and it turns out there are little aneurysms that never, uh, that will burst immediately and there are big aneurysms that never burst. So there's no real criterion for deciding when surgery is. These are great places for computations to come in. And, uh, and real-time computations. The patient is there, you get all the uh, uh, scans and immediately run these simulations and tell them back uh, 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 something that the neurosurgeon can say, okay, I'm not going to operate on him right now. And uh, we have had lots of cases like that. So, and growth and remodeling is how the body can adapt itself uh, to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, change uh, up, uh, to mechanical loads and actually uh, impact uh, the mechanics. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a paper that I worked on, on in the Journal of Biomechanics, which involves uh, a lady that, uh, who's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the MRI charts actually showed that, um, after she was dead, uh, her aneurysm was being pushed by something. And we said, okay, if, uh, you know, just like in research, you hypothesize, okay, if the aneurysm can be pushed by a long constraint, the aneurysm can be pushed by a short constraint. So if it's a long constraint, maybe like a balloon, if you're blowing up, it's going to flatten out. If it's like a, if you're blowing a balloon and somebody comes with a pin and pricks it, it's going to blow. So what if it is actually touching something at the end of a nerve, for, for example? And so... Apparently, this lady was complaining of uh, visual irritation, and she was going to the uh, eye doctor and for two years before she passed away. And uh, our research ended up showing that there must be something that the aneurysm was hitting. It turned out that the aneurysm was hitting an optic nerve, and the nerve was expressing symptoms. 
And so this was not caught uh, at that point. So this is the type of things your research can actually dictate back to you. So, um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, we use finite elements to doing these things. And, uh, you know, things like contact constraints, elastodynamics, I'm interested in the fluid structure interaction problems and all that. But uh, anytime an undergraduate walks into my lab, you know, I, I want to give them uh, simple problems. So, you know, so when I say simple problem, look at the, the arterial wall doesn't move. That's the first part. And then you have like, uh, you know, uh, nice canned geometries where you have Navier Stokes coming in, you know, moving the aneurysm wall back and forth, at least to give some good insight and all that. So, you know, even though these are not simple problems. So, bio inspired. What I mean by bio inspired are the types of problems from, for example, the Air Force is interested in. So, I'm involved in this type of a project, which is uh, micro air vehicles. For me, it's only a fluid structure interaction problem. In the last problem, the fluid was inside the structure. Here, the fluid is outside the structure. That's the only difference. So if I come up with a theory, then I have to figure out how to actually manipulate the different domains. So uh, of course, these are uh, flying at uh, you know, small size, so obviously low Reynolds numbers. So you know, uh, people wanted something that's small that can carry enough payload, like videos and video camera and things like that, but for a longer period of time and all that. So once again, it started off with applications to reconnaissance and all these different things. And now, you know, maybe with the wall, it will be traffic monitoring and all that stuff. But, uh, um, you know, there's several uh, applications for that. Uh, swarming is a big deal now. So to be a, uh, uh, like drones talking to each other to uh, little uh, MAVs talking to each other and all that stuff. So uh, typically you have this type of a structure where you have like these beam type materials and then you have a membrane material and your fluid around it, so you know, and uh, so there's structural dynamics, fluid dynamics, of course there's guidance and control and propulsion. Again, computing is an umbrella under all of them. Um, and then, of course, this is a toy problem by an undergraduate who's trying to understand, you know, a non uh, beam and uh, Navier Stokes around it and trying to actually, you know, get to simulate and really get an insight into this problem before they actually, you know, uh, uh, start to work on a bigger project. What makes these interesting is they're all fully three-dimensional, heterogeneous, anisotropic, you know, uh, their volumes could be, could be changing. This is probably the biggest uh, one, nonlinear versus linear, and large versus small deformations. That makes the computation very, very challenging. So especially when you're solving Navier-Stokes with a structural equation, and the structural, I mean, the time steps are completely different. So when the time steps are completely different, and people are always using these algorithms that are uh, fluent on one side or you know ab abacus on the other side, and then they go back and forth and all that stuff. But when you solve a monolithic approach, solving the whole thing as one system, uh, when a fluid uh, equation behaves very differently from a structural equation, it becomes challenging, and that's when computations take a big uh, uh, you know uh, big impact. So. Uh, all these problems need kinematics. How do you map material points from one place to the other? You need to talk about all sorts of forces, gravity, stresses, stress rates. Then you invoke all five balance relations, conservation of mass, linear momentum, angular momentum, energy, and entropy. At that point, you have like a decent a differential equation, but there are terms that are not connected. This is exactly where mechanical engineers and bioengineers spend half their life coming up with constitutive loss. How does the material respond to applied load? If I apply with a certain force to my hand versus the same force to this, this thing here, they're made out of different materials, so this loss must be different. You can't use Hooke's law for everything, right? So, so this is exactly where, uh, once you have this, now you have some compatibility conditions. Now you have a big system of equations that you have to solve, and then you need boundary conditions and initial conditions, and this is when you get boundary and initial value problems. So, um, so this is where, you know, uh, my whole thing has been going from physical system to a mathematical model, which many of us uh, do. And of course, we all tend to uh, go for an analytical solution if we can, you know, if we can. Uh, if, if we don't, then we end up, uh, most of our life is in this part here, so the numerics, and I know many of the faculty here pretty much, you know, live here. But uh, what, uh, what is interesting is most uh, mathematicians and computation uh, folks that I, I meet, they are very good in these two, uh, numerics and theory. Um, and to them, the third important thing is often missing is experimental data. So what ends up happening is, you know, say proposals, you know, and you're solving this huge problem and all that stuff. It has this major impact on biology and all this stuff. When you don't have an actual biology data, you know, you could get dinged for something as simple as that. 
right? So, you know, having a, a collaboration and so, but, you know, where theory actually dictates the, you know, the type of numerics that you want to perform, the numerics actually needs to correlate with the experimental data. The experimental data helps you to figure out the parameters that, you know, validate the model. So, it's a, it's a, anytime you're doing something, you know, it's, it's important to actually have all three. You don't have to be an expert in all three, at least two of the three, but definitely having that third component is super important to any agency, okay? So, uh, I'm not going to preach this because, you know, you all know that modeling starts with observation, then coming up with the theory, then coming up with some kind of a formulation, say Hooke's law. You're going to describe the parameters in the, in the law. Then you're going to do some analysis to figure out uh, what those uh, laws are and, and then validate and predict. Now, this prediction is, uh, you know, this, this, this notion of modeling, uh, as I said, I want to go back to that, uh, that uh, time where most of us spend on finding the appropriate constitutive law you know, how does the stress relate to a strain and things like that. So what is that law? Is it Hooke's law? Is it Fung law? Is it what type of law are we, are we talking about? You know, for that you need to describe the general characteristics of the material that you're working with. Now you need a, to establish a theoretical framework. And once you establish, then you have to actually be able to identify specific functional forms. What type is it linear, nonlinear? And then in the forms, you're going to have parameters. So you've got to then, you know, uh, 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 calculate those parameters. And once you do that, then you have a model, but you have to evaluate the predictive capability of the model. These are very important things to actually say, this is the model you want to use, okay? So uh, the reason I'm saying this is because I like this one, all models are wrong, okay? But the good news is, you know, some are more wrong than the other. So uh, this gives me some confidence to go after some models and all that. So it's a very interesting statement that actually has a lot of value. Let me, uh, maybe, because some of you are interested, again, I may not go through all of it, but uh, let me just go through some of it. So, you know, I've, I've been doing some work in uh, infectious diseases recently and uh, was uh, able to publish one of the first uh, mathematical models in Zika. And, uh, uh, but I would really like help with uncertainty quantification, making it, uh, I would like to write with some of you, maybe the first machine learning paper in Zika, it's not there out yet, you know, so, and I've been having some ideas and, uh, you know, so, and let me explain why, because this is uh, uh, the standard model people follow from uh, uh, Ronald Ross, uh, who was the uh, person who won the Nobel Prize for uh, the path of malaria, his two students, uh, Kermak and McKendrick, uh, you know, who had chemical engineering and statistics background, they came up with this notion of, you know, all the people in the town are susceptible. Some of them get infected, and then some of those infected people become recovered. So it came out to be this interesting model called the SIR model, very famous model, and uh, you just describe the rate of change of the susceptibles uh, becoming infected, and some of them becoming recovered, and so on. Of course, assumptions like, oh, the population is always constant. Okay, so those types of things were thrown in, and so these are assumptions that are thrown in to solve the problem. Uh, but then people started to change this model. Uh, so, for example, you know, the, a good mosquito biting an infected human and uh, becoming infected and then going and biting a healthy human and then the healthy, so this whole cycle of vectors started to come in, vector bonds. So before that, it was only uh, by touch or by sexual transmission. So the people started saying, oh, what if I become susceptible again, like SIRS. What if I never recover? Yeah, there are diseases, syphilis, gonorrhea, all these uh, sexually transmitted is SIS. What if I'm, if a mosquito bites me, I don't get infected by I'm exposed? Sure, then there is an SEIR model. What about SEIRS model? And so you can come up with a host of models. And, uh, but what was interesting was, there was this two groups of people, just like fluid dynamics and solid mechanics, there was like people that would do sexual transmission and by touch type disease, infectious diseases, people that would do vector bond diseases. And they would have their own conferences and, you know, they would find their own theory and all that. And then comes Zika, right? And uh, so, uh, of course, you can do all these interesting dynamics and all that. So, before I talk about Zika, so you can plot, you can do a simple, you know, Rangikuta, for example, and all that. And, and then they do all these nice things, and then you go to Tanzania and collect data and put the data of infected, and here's the infected. When the actual infected is this green. And then you say, wait, my model is saying something, the infected data is something, 14 day data is saying something you know, which one is correct? Of course, uh, you know, your model is not correct. Something in your model is not correct. So uh, then you could, of course, do some, you know, I always have students do GUIs uh, just to, you know, illustrate. So uh, 
So what they are doing is, you know, of course they are doing something like a fmin search to actually figure out uh, what will be the best parameters in the model to fit the data. So then you, you're starting to really help out at what rate is that in that particular town the disease is propagating. Then you can go and do some kind of uh, uh, after planning based on the rate at which something is growing. So, and then you could actually do all sorts of uh, things like, for example, you could uh, add, uh, uh, you know, you could, uh, uh, you know, you could do some kind of logistic type ideas and all that stuff. You could actually add, uh, yeah, logistic type things and uh, you could talk about carrying capacity. You could also talk, to start adding uh, PDEs, make it PDEs. So, you know, people taking the disease uh, and going on a plane and starting to give diseases to other people, right? So we know that happened with uh, somebody with, a tu with tuberculosis going on a plane and things like that. So what happens then? And uh, you can keep, you know, um, you can talk, talk about adding diffusion and logistic in, uh, in all the models and all that. So things start to get crazier and then now you start to see a real use for hardcore computing when you start doing like big PDs with differential equations and I mean with boundary conditions and all that. And this is actually probably the simplest one. When you talk about big systems, I'm talking about equations that are like, you know, 300 equations and things like that, you know, mad cow disease and all that stuff. Most of them use Rangikuta, okay, but uh, they would probably not do it for two days and things like that, okay. So, so Zika brings a completely different uh, touch to the problem because it made these two communities come together. And lucky that I was, I, didn't, I wasn't a part of the community, so I said, oh, I'll start with Zika. And what was interesting about Zika was Zika could be sexually transmitted and it could be vector transmitted. So all the theories that was developed, uh, assuming vector transmission and sexual transmission, the theoretical, uh, they, they call it the basic reproduction number and all that stuff, it's not developed for a full uh, problem. So this was a natural opportunity for me as a researcher to jump in and say, oh, maybe I should take a look at this. And then we looked at this. We were able to derive some nice results and all that. And uh, there was a paper in Siam uh, at, uh, at some point, Siam News, about what Zika was that the, you know, you could also be, uh, you could have this sexual transmission that goes on between the SEIR, this is for the humans, H, and then SEI for the vector, vector is the mosquito, and the, you know, then this, uh, uh, including sexual transmission, we enhanced this and came up with a slightly interesting model and then we published it in some, uh, in one of the journals. But then uh, um, this is the type of thing. Now you have a model that you can actually enhance and try to understand how to actually study this and you can enhance this. This is probably the simplest model for Zika. Once you have bigger problems, we didn't have enough computational power to do these problems and all that and we'd love to. This is where one can actually collaborate and all that. So, so one of the things I was very interested in is when you build, say, cars, uh, when people design different parts of the car, when the meshes are not matching, this is traditional finite elements, they match everything. You know, small elements with big elements and all that stuff. And so my research was on what if, you know, Andreas builds the car, uh, build, wins the windshield, and uh, Bill wins the, you know, builds the engine, I build something else, and we give it to third person, would you buy the car? That's the question. So, you know, and uh, so the whole thing is, uh, when all these things are coming together, how do you build a finite element package that puts all these things together? So I'm going to skip these slides, and this is what my area was, and we came up with these things called two-field methods, uh, where we use Lagrange multipliers to glue the solutions on each side. And then there's a very interesting mathematical framework that you can come up with, and there's a lot of good uh, theoretical estimates that you can prove. Uh, you can expand it to three-field methods uh, for three-dimensional things, and we have tested it on uh, Lots of different types of uh, computing scenarios with uh, what if I take a big domain and actually break it into different types of uh, 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 meshes, try to look for speed ups, uh, and, uh, uh, and then how do you expand it to for something like fluid and structure? One side you're solving Navier-Stokes, one side you're solving uh, shell equations or linear elasticity equations and you're trying to actually use a different grid, different grid. We're not even talking time scales, we're talking grids, spatial. Uh, not matching, not just temporal not matching. So this becomes a serious problem. So, and then you can actually have some simulations and all that, but uh, so again, uh, in interest of time, so this is like, if you look at, at arterial wall, here's blood coming, this is the part of the wall, and this is the, this is the part of the, uh, you know, inside of the artery and things like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just skip this thing, I'll be happy to give you, this is just, we use a framework called the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian framework. We 
uh, reformulate the, work, uh, the weak formulation and solve this using a very special global velocity formula. We pretend that structures are velocity and we solve it using a global velocity formulation. So, and we apply it to, for example, you have a, you have a building right there and you have a, a wind coming through and what if I use different types of grids, which grids will perform better? And you try to actually simulate these things and uh, try to see, uh, you know, study vortices and things like that uh, in the flow. So, uh, and then we, we want to see, you know, do we have to waste all our resources on building grids like this? Because we could just build something like this, which is not very costly and still get the same exact efficiency and accuracy. So, so uh, in the ending, you know, there's several ways to take your research. You could just take somebody's work and modify their assumptions. You could take somebody's work and change their geometry. Everything is new, right? So you could take a, a 3,000 line code and make it 30 lines. I know people have built professions on this. Um, you know, you could enhance somebody's mathematical software. You could match experimental data. This is the hard one, you know, so and, uh, it's a great one to work on. Refine somebody's uh, mathematical model, you know, more and more. So um, most of the students that I work with, this is uh, uh, Mark Warner, he's the, the one that is heading the policy on, uh, uh, he was setting the policy on drones and then this investigation with the uh, Russian thing and all that stuff. So anyway, we got a chance. I mean, it's great to take students all the way to talk to these guys because I often think, you know, they don't have time to speak, but it's very interesting. When they find undergraduate students, they just talk, talk and talk. They want to drop other things and just talk. This is fantastic for, for me as a faculty. So, and uh, also, uh, as a program director, it's, it's been great because I see both sides uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where the resources must be spent and all that, okay? So I guess I'll stop here. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. Yes, Andreas. So I'll, I'll be mean and repeat yeah. a question that I have to ask earlier. Hopefully huh. I'll be mean and repeat a question that I asked earlier. Yes. More or less all the, uh, that, that's my sense at least, more or less all the things that I found interesting and engaging in your, in your talk were um, of interdisciplinary nature. Yet, if I look at the NSF homepage, it's division of division of division. If, how, how is the organization responding and what, what, what is a good strategy to, to sort of be able to do that type of work? So it's actually, I'm glad you asked this because... Uh, uh, you know, websites are like websites, like, you know, <laughs> it's not like nothing fancy and all that stuff, but uh, what they are doing is uh, trying to come up with uh, very interdisciplinary programs. That's one way they are doing this, and uh, they are asking people to put, uh, from different divisions, to put money together and create programs. For example, you know, Infuse. This is like food, energy, water, and so where you can bring divisions together to, so math division can put some money, biology can put, put some money and all that. So uh, data, for example, you know, computational data science and engineering, it's a separate program by itself and, uh, and international programs. So I think uh, one way they are doing is creating new programs. You know, so instead of everybody wants to own their department of biology, department of uh, mathematical sciences, that's not going to change. Uh, I, I, I mean, I should probably take that back. Uh, the departments will probably be departments, but the colleges are getting reshaped in many universities. Arizona State University did this. They, they created interdisciplinary colleges. So this is the type of thing that uh, it'll be hard for me to believe that NSF will go immediately in that direction. They still want to have those uh, pockets of expertise like size and uh, uh, MPS and things like that. But the programmatic things that they are trying to do is, uh, is across, across division. So, uh, so for PIs and potential PIs that are going to apply to the NSF. Many of you, even the GRFP folks, don't know probably, but you could actually name multiple things to, you could talk to the program director and say, mine has a computer science flavor also. Should I just apply to the computational mathematics program or will it be considered by ACI in size, for example? Usual recommendation would be, why, would you, why don't you put primary as one and secondary as the other? That does have a slight, dis, you know, it could have a disadvantage because it could be reviewed by two panels. And you could get, uh, you know, one bad review and one good review in one and different types of things. But in general, if you feel like half of your proposal has to do with, you know, so it's very truly multidisciplinary, then we want to actually hear that because it helps us to, you know, the program directors to go and look for funding, saying, 
you know, this project has half computer science. Can you give some money? And so this is how it works. So like, for example, you work with Sushil. Sushil and I worked on projects where we co-funded things. And, you know, if there's a project that come that is going to be funded and he asks, he thinks there's lots of uh, you know, great math in it, he'll come immediately to computational math. And the same thing the other way. This always happens. So this is like, so it doesn't fix your question of like, if you go to the web page, we do everything, you know. So we work together. I, I don't think that's going to, uh, but that's kind of the idea on everybody's mind. And uh, just like universities, you know, it's still going to be colleges and then uh, you have faculty working together. So, so yeah, but interdisciplinary is definitely the way to go. But I would, I would really, actually, this may be a good thing to talk about. Um, I was just talking to Bill and uh, 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 Farsina before this. So there is a program for undergraduates. Are there undergraduates sitting in the audience? No, OK. So maybe faculty. Uh, there's a program called GCSP. When you get a chance, Google National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program. And in 2014, the several prominent National Academy members came together and came up with 14 grand challenges, 2014. Uh, it's like harnessing solar energy, reverse engineering the brain. So it's like big thematic ideas, which I'm sure you know, a few of us in the room can come up with. But what came out of that was very interesting. Is they came up with a program called the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. Now, this program is, uh, so Urbana is, uh, UIUC is also invited. There's about 50 institutions invited to submit like a, uh, I don't know what they call it, like a proposal to have that program in the institution. It doesn't bring money, but it actually brings fame and recognition. So this is actually a big deal because the students that are going to be selected into this program, uh, soon, by the way, it will be coming to grad school also. Uh, it will be uh, in high school also. So this is a program, this is a type of program you want to think about scaling like a pipeline for probably an NSF proposal, for example. So the students that go through this program have to do five things. What is research? What is interdisciplinary? What is service learning? What is entrepreneurship? And what is global? So everything that I talked about. So if you have a student that's going to do a global project, he, he or she goes to a, and does an entrepreneurship aspect of it, and then does the service learning. Like several of you said, oh, we want to do engineering in high schools here. I want to go and do some after school clubs and those types of things. So if you package that, then you become a National Academy of Engineering scholar. I don't know what all comes with it, but there's some cool things that come with it, especially the title. Okay, so and uh, apparently something happens on graduation. You get some National Academies coming here and doing something. You know, I'm not sure about what the result is, but Several universities have already jumped in. I know that uh, UIUC is preparing uh, a proposal to submit and all that. So I think you definitely, uh, if you have a chance uh, to however contribute, faculty can contribute to courses in those five things. Or uh, you, know, you may already have courses that can fit into those five things and all that stuff. So you could, I think the dean of engineering is probably will be leading it, but multiple colleges, I think you guys should totally be a big part of this because I think the students, I mean, there should be a computing course in the curriculum somewhere there. So, you know, and uh, so feel free to send me an email, you know, uh, anytime. And then we can definitely, you know, I'll touch base with Bill and uh, Farzina and, uh, and Andreas. And hopefully, you know, we can have some collaborations going. So thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you.